Hi everyone! Welcome back to my channel and to video number two in my little sculpting series. Today I'll be sculpting a little happy faced jack-o'-lantern. This will be a part two of a four part series. We'll sculpt three little polymer clay pumpkins and finish out October by painting them, and I figured we could chat about seasonal topics while I sculpt. Since this is our happy jack-o'-lantern, I thought it could be fun to talk about happier things and maybe share some of my fondest Halloween memories with you. As you can see, I've already got a lot of my foil bases built, so we skipped right to adding the clay on this one. I was extra careful with maintaining my orientation on this guy because I knew he was going to have a big, open expression. Although when I started, I wasn't entirely sure which face I was going to sculpt into it. This tool really became a strong favorite of mine. I became very confident with it quicker than I expected, and it made the process all that faster as well. In case it hasn't become obvious, Halloween has always been one of my favorite holidays. I have so many fond childhood memories of Halloween. There was a time when my family lived in a nice suburban neighborhood with lots of other families. In that neighborhood, I vividly remember one house that always had bobbing for apples. It kind of blows my mind to think back and realize that I actually got to experience that. Bobbing for apples, for those who don't know, is where you toss a whole bunch of apples, usually red delicious, into a large bin or bucket filled with water, and make a game out of trying to pick an apple out of the water using only your mouth. As a kid, this was a fantastic, crazy challenge. It was something that sounded so easy, but upon putting face into water, you found out just how frustratingly impossible it was. First, you're jarred by the frigid water that had been exposed to the late October elements, then, if you got past that shock, you had to remember to actually somehow snap your teeth into one of those buoyant fruits. Easy enough if it weren't for that pesky water. Without the right technique, every clasp of the jaw sent your prey spinning out of your reach. Then you had to make the judgment call of pulling back and diving in again, or staying in the water and thrashing about like a shark trying to claim the next closest mark. All without nearly drowning, mind you. I honestly can't remember if I ever actually succeeded but I do remember that there was one kid who always claimed an apple on his first try. There's always that one kid. And I think this memory is extra funny because as an adult, I would never even consider shoving my face into a cesspool filled with other people's saliva and risk biting into an apple that had already been grazed from another person's attempt on it. Kinda gross, let's be real. But those kinds of things don't occur to most kids. While that neighborhood was a lot of fun, we didn't stay there for very long. At least, if we go by my age and capability of remembering. However, when we were in apartment complexes, we would go trick-or-treating with my cousins instead. One cousin in particular lived in a great neighborhood for trick-or-treating. The houses were perfectly spaced apart, and they didn't have cul-de-sac, just many winding, interconnecting roads with abundant sidewalks. Oh, how I miss sidewalks. You could easily hit two or three rows in the allotted time, but it wasn't just the prime location and the layout that made trick-or-treating with them memorable. It was two particular houses. For anonymity, let's say it was Mr. Funny and Susie B. Now, Mr. Funny definitely thought he was funny. He gave out great candy. I think it might have even been king-sized candy bars. But 
Mr. Funny did not give out candy for free. His acceptable payment did not include a simple doorbell ring and the lion's trick-or-treat, but since that is the coined term, he decided that in order to get a treat, a very good treat, mind you, you had to do a trick. He wasn't too picky, but you had to put in some level of effort for sure. Some kids did crazy things, but others would try to do cartwheels or handstands. Still somewhat impressive if you consider how cumbersome some costumes can be. And there were times when he deemed tricks as unworthy, causing some kids to rack their brains and tax their bodies trying to score that special reward. Susie B was an entirely different kind of wonderful, memorable trick-or-treat stop. She was very plain Jane. I don't remember much in the way of decorations outside her house. She probably didn't have any. And I can't for the life of me tell you what she looked like. But Miss Susie B gave out something very special and unique on Halloween night. Do you want to guess? Go on, I'll wait. Scroll down to the comments and see if you can guess what special thing Susie B gave out trick-or-treaters. Did you put your guess in the comments? No cheating now. All right, all right. Miss Plain Jane Susie B gave out tiny little loaves of Wonder Bread. I kid you not. Fully wrapped, fully sliced, perfectly tiny, fit perfectly in a kid's hand, loaves of Wonder Bread. Now sure, you might say, Tabs, that's a terrible treat. But guys, they were tiny little loaves of Wonder Bread. I can't tell you why we got them every year. I don't know if we even ate them. But I can guarantee you that every year we stopped at her house and picked up a tiny loaf of our own. We'll be kind to child me and family and say that we just had really good manners. Or maybe we were just so blown by the idea of getting such an obscure treat. As I grew older, there'd be fewer and fewer fun stories like these to tell. But the last neighborhood I was able to trick-or-treat in rewarded stragglers very handsomely. There was always more candy than trick-or-treaters, so if you stayed out a little later than most, people would be dumping half-full bowls of candy into your bags. That was definitely the point where we upgraded from little buckets to pillowcases. <laughs> No matter the age and no matter the year, though, I have always been about dressing up for Halloween. And I rarely stick to just store-bought costumes. I blame my wonderful mother for that. She was an impressive seamstress. Perhaps it was a Mormon thing, I don't know. 
but she made some of the most incredible costumes. I remember one year in particular where she made a gorgeous golden renaissance dress. We're talking puffy sleeves, puffy skirt, coiled hat, the whole shebang. I think I, it even ended up being like four or five pieces that we had to, to tie and lace and loop together. I don't even know if I have pictures left of me in it, which is a shame because again, it was drop dead gorgeous. Everything I've dressed up since then has basically been put together, hodgepodged, if you will. I was the same with my cosplays too. I've only ever straight up bought maybe two cosplays and those were pretty complicated and would have required more knowledge, time, and skill than I had at the time. Let's see, what can I remember? I do remember I, I made this shoddy Alice Madness Returns inspired Alice costume. I bought and bloodied a dress, painted a prop knife to match the one from the game, bought a nice quality top hat and stitched white patches on it to match one of the hats from the game. And most of that costume is still shoved in my closet somewhere, save for the top hat. That stays near my desk. <laughs> It was uh, to sew all those patches on, and I'm still a little proud of the results. Major props to anyone who dabbles in hat making. There was a dead bride, nothing terribly unique about it, but I had to give some extra stitching and love to the dress I bought, and combine it with a few gothic vibe accessories, you know, arm warmers, some lace, uh, stockings, boots, the whole shebang. Plus, you know, I had to do the full face makeup as well. We felt cute and deadly, guys. Let's be real, we felt cute and deadly. It was a good, it was a good vibe that Halloween. And it was a really fun combination. Oh, okay. So you thinking back, I actually have to rescind my previous statement. I completely forgot about the years when I went full ass lazy and just wore my fox Kigurumi. Like I kid you not, just threw on that comfy mofo and handed out candy because let's be real, some years you just want to lounge. I think that's going to wrap this one up, guys. Thank you so much for joining me on this trip down memory lane. I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my little anecdotes and hope it made you remember some of your childhood or pine for some of your childhood. Please join me next time where we're going to be doing our sad little pumpkin. I don't know what I have planned for our sad pumpkin, but probably going to either be something that is sad, makes you sad, or will make me sad. Yeah, I don't know. It should be pretty interesting. Thanks, guys. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.